Oh, good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazar, and today is uh, 20th of March 2021. And uh, right now, I am with you, uh, Mr. Subject. We are studying is Physics 5054, O level physics. And today, we are going to solve uh, MCQ paper. We call it paper one. And this year, you know, most of our students have taken the exemption due to the COVID 19. The Cambridge has offered us uh, exemption from the ATP paper. So there are only two papers in which our students are going to appear. That is paper one and paper, paper two. So we are putting our all forces to prepare them for paper one and paper two. So today in this session, we will be working on a paper one. This is May, June 2016, 1-1. One, one. This is a zone one paper. So let's start this paper. So the first question which is coming on your screen, uh, you can see the diagram shows arrows representing two vector quantities. So here we have two vectors and I want to add them. Which diagram shows the resultant R of these two vectors? These diagrams, they are showing that they are using the par parallelogram law to add the vectors in the parallelogram law. And the vectors to be added, they should be put in such a way that their tails are joined. We put the, both the vectors to be added in such a way that their tails are joined. And then we suppose that they are the adjacent sides of a parallelogram. And we complete that parallelogram. And the resultant we get by joining the point where the tails are joined with the opposite corner of the parallelogram. So if you look at the diagram D, so here you can see the two vectors to be added. They have put in them in such a way that their tails are joined. And then they completed the parallelogram. And then they joined the point where the tails are joined with the opposite corner of the parallelogram. So that represents the resultant. So to me, D is the option, sir. D looks the best option. The rest of them are not good. They are not obeying the parallelogram law of vector addition. So to me, question number one, uh, D is the option. Let's check the marking scheme. Question number one, D is the option. Okay. So here we go. Question number two. Which of uh, which set of quantities are all vectors? Acceleration, displacement, velocity. This list, acceleration is a vector. Displacement is a vector. Velocity is a vector. So A looks the best option, sir. Uh, for example, in the B, and the chemical energy is a, energy is a scalar quantity. Extension, force, gravitational potential energy. The, uh, the gravitational potential energy is a scalar quantity. Weight, kinetic, kinetic energy is a, uh, is a scalar quantity. So A is a list which has all the vectors. So question number two, to me, A is the option. Yes, marking scheme says A. Okay, question number three is on your screen. A student determines the circumference of a golf ball circumference of a golf ball circumference of a golf ball which instrument gives the reading that is the circumference of the golf ball calipers calipers can find the diameter of the golf ball micrometer can also be used uh, golf ball i don't know who the micrometer i think will be golf ball is quite large for the micrometer and the micrometer will be only able to tell you the diameter the rule i don't think the golf ball and the rule go together the tape, yes, the tape can be used to find out the circumference because you can uh, wind the tape around the golf ball and it will give you the circumference of the golf ball. So tape is the best answer for the circumference of the golf ball. Question number three, D is the option. Yeah, D is the option. We reduce the size so you can see it clearly. Okay. The graph shows how the speed of a car varies with the time. So it's here in this diagram, the speed time graph is shown on the y-axis. 
the speed is represented on the x-axis, the time is represented. And one thing which you should know is the slope, the gradient of this uh, speed time graph represents the acceleration. So if you look at this carefully, the slope is gradually decreasing, decreasing. And here in this portion, the slope has become zero. When the graph has become horizontal, the slope is zero. So the slope is gradually decreasing and finally it becomes zero, which means that the acceleration is gradually decreasing and finally it becomes zero. Says so which statement about the acceleration of the car between 10 seconds and 20 seconds? From 10 seconds to 20 seconds, the graph is horizontal, which means the slope is zero, which means the acceleration is zero. From 10 to 20 seconds, the acceleration remained zero. So I think D is the best option. The acceleration is zero. Question number four, you can see that D is the right answer. Okay, on your screen, we have question number five. A man pulls a sledge of mass 25 kg across level ground with a horizontal force of 60 Newton. A constant force of friction of 20 Newton acts on the sledge. What is the acceleration of the sledge? Acceleration can be found by the Newton's second law. F is equal to ma. But that F value is basically the resultant force. So I can find the resultant force by subtracting the frictional force from the horizontal force. 60 Newton minus 20 Newton, 40 Newton will be the resultant force. And then I can use F is equal to ma. I know the mass. I know the resultant force, which is 40 Newton. And I can find out the acceleration. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. Resultant force will be applied force minus the frictional force, 60 Newton minus 20 Newton, 40 Newton. Then I will use the Newton's second law of motion, F is equals to MA. The resultant force is 40, mass is 25 kg. And acceleration is question mark. A will be equals to 40 divided by 25. Do this on the calculator and you will get the answer. 1.6 meter per second square. 1.6 meter per second square. I hope that uh, you have understood this calculation. So B is the option for question number 5. 1.6 meter per second square. Let's check the marking scheme. Yeah, question number five, B is the option. A car moves in a circle at constant speed. What is the direction of the resultant force acting on the car? You see this car is moving in a circular path. And this is here, the center of the circle in which the car is moving. The resultant force is always directed towards the center of that circle. The resultant force, or we call it the centripetal force also, that is always directed towards the center of that circle. So I think B is the option. Question number six, B is the option, sir. I hope you have understood that the resultant force when you are moving in a circle is always directed towards the center of that circle. So B is the best option. the size a brick is placed on a newton meter and then on a beam balance what is measured by each instrument this newton meter measures the weight it also measures the force and the beam balance measures the mass Newton meter measures the weight and the beam balance measures the mass. So I think C is the best option. Question number seven. C is the option, sir. Question eight, <clears throat> a 
force acts on a body which list contains only quantities that can be changed by a force the force applied when you apply force on a body the shape of the body can be changed the velocity of the body can be changed the volume of the body can be changed but one thing which you cannot change is the mass his question is which list contains only quantities that can be changed by a force changed by the force so all the lists which have mass you cannot take that option because mass cannot be changed by applying force shape velocity volume they can be changed so d is the best option d is the best option sir yeah marking scheme says d d is the best option so a uniform horizontal beam pivoted at its right hand and is in equilibrium a force of 60 newton acts vertically upward on the beam as shown what is the weight of the beam here try to understand this thing uh, here i have the pivot the pivot is here on the right side here is the center of gravity the weight of the beam is acting here downward so it's trying to produce an anti clockwise moment here we have applied the force of 60 newton in the upward direction so this is trying to produce a clockwise moment because the whole system is in equi in equilibrium so the anti clockwise moment and the clockwise moment they are equal the 60 newton force its distance is perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot is 50 cm the distance the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the weight and the pivot is 30 cm so i can apply the formula i have done this on a paper let me show you okay so question number 9 anti clockwise moment is equals to clockwise moment w multiply 30 cm equals to 60 newton multiply 50 cm so w will be equals to 60 multiply 50 divided by 30 do this calculation and the answer will be 100 newton 100 newton i hope you have understood this calculation 100 newton is the answer so it looks d is the right option sir d looks the right option four table lamps are shown along with the position m of the center of mass in each case which lamp is the most stable the most stable will be that lamp whose whose uh, center of mass is lowest the center of mass is lowest that is the option that will be the most stable so a looks the best option the center of mass the height of the center of mass is lowest that's why it will be more stable question number 10 a is the option let's check oh yes question number 10 a is the option okay a child slides down a slide the weight of the child is 250 newton the height of the slide is 7 meter the work done against friction as the child travels down the slide is 1300 joules what is the change in the gravitational potential energy and what is the final kinetic energy of the child you see strategy is very simple the the loss the change in the gravitational potential energy or the loss in the gravitational potential energy can be found by the formula weight multiply height and height means vertical height weight of the child is 250 newton and the vertical height from where it came, he came down is 7 meter so you will get the loss in the gravitational potential energy now the gain in the kinetic energy will be equals to the 
loss in the potential energy minus the work done against the friction. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my calculations. Okay, so here we go. Potential energy is equals to weight multiply height, 250 multiply 7. It will be 1750 joules. So the gain in the kinetic energy will be equals to the change in the potential energy minus the work done against the friction. So 1750 joules minus 1300 joules. So the gain in the kinetic energy will be 450 joules. I hope that you have understood this idea, this calculation. The loss in the gravitational potential energy should be equals to the gain in the kinetic energy, but that is an ideal equation. In the real situation, what happens, some of your potential energy is lost in the form of heat due to the friction. So the gain in the kinetic energy is equals to the potential energy, the loss in the gravitational potential energy minus the work done against the friction. You should understand this idea. Hope you have understood. So 450 joules will be the gain in the kinetic energy. So let's check what are the options. The change in the gravitational potential energy we just calculated, that is 1750 seven, joules. And the kinetic energy will be 450 joules. So I think A is the best option, sir. A is the best option. Let's check the marking scheme. Let's increase the size so you can understand. Checks the mark. Let's check marking scheme. Okay, so A is the best option. Question number 11. A is the option, sir. What uses non renewable energy? The question is what uses non renewable energy? A geothermal heating system, it uses renewable energy source. A nuclear power station, yes, that's non-renewable. Nuclear power station is non-renewable. So B looks the option. A solar panel is an, it's a renewable energy source. A wind turbine is a renewable energy source. So what uses non-renewable energy source? B is the option, nuclear power station. Question number 12, B is the option. Which process in the sun produces energy? In the sun, the process of fusion is taking place. In the fusion, what happens? Smaller hydrogen nuclei, they come close and they fuse into each other and they make a large nucleus of helium. This process is called nuclear fusion. And during this process, an enormous amount of energy is given out. And that is the source of the energy in the sun. So nuclear fusion is the answer. C, question number 13, C is the option. Yeah, C is the option, sir. So here we go. Question number, uh, I think I need to reduce the size a little bit. Okay. A 300 Newton force is applied to a box to move it up a ramp as shown. How much work is done by the force when moving the box from X to Y? You see, whenever you move uh, on an inclined ramp, the work done can be calculated by two methods. The work done can be calculated by uh, the formula gain in the potential energy. Work done will be equal to the gain in the potential energy. In that case, we use the formula MGH. H means the vertical height gain. For example, here it's three meter. And mg means m means the mass, g is the gravitational field strength. Or the gravitational potential energy can be also calculated by the formula weight multiply height. But here, I don't know what is the weight of this uh, block, this box. But the work done can be calculated by another method, the traditional method which is uh, work done is equal to the force multiplied by the distance traveled in the direction of the force. If you look at this example carefully, 
I know the force which is applied, that is 300 Newton. I know the direction of the force and the body moved in the direction of this force, how much? Five meters. So I can calculate the work done by this method also. Work done is equals to force multiplied distance traveled in the direction of the force by the body. So F multiplied D, I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So here, here we go. Work done is equals to F multiplied D, 300 Newton is the force and the body moved five meter in the direction of the force. So 300 multiplied five, 1500 joules is the work done. I hope you have understood this idea that when you move uh, on an inclined ramp or plane, uh, the work done can be calculated by two methods. So don't confuse them. It depends upon the data that which method of, of calculating the work done we will use. So here in this example, we have used the formula work done is equal to the force multiply the distance which is traveled in the direction of the force. So 1,500 is the answer. C looks the best option, sir. 1,500 Joule is the answer. Let's check the marking scheme. 14 C is the option. Yeah, our answer is right. Four because contains the same liquid. At which point is the pressure the greatest? The pressure inside a liquid depends upon the depth of the liquid above that point. The pressure of the liquid in, inside the liquid depends upon the depth of the liquid above that point. So here in A, there is no liquid above this point. Uh, in the B option, there is liquid. The height of the depth of the liquid is here. The greatest depth is in C, the depth of the liquid above that point. Mark my words, what I'm saying. The depth of the liquid above that point. So in the C, the depth of the liquid above the point C is the greatest. So at the point C, the pressure will be greatest. So I think C is the option, sir. Let's check. Question number 15, C is the option. Water of depth 10 meter exerts a pressure equals to one atmospheric pressure. So one 10 meter water, its pressure will be equals to one atmosphere. An air bubble rises to the surface of the lake, which is 20 meter deep. When the bubble reaches the surface, its volume is 6 centimeter cube. What is the volume of the air bubble at the bottom of the lake? Okay. So, um, let me show you my work. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you. Okay. Let me increase the size. Try to understand this. When you are inside this lake, at the bottom of the lake, the depth of this water is 20 meters. The depth of this water is 20 meters. 10 meter water, its pressure is equal to one atmosphere. This 20 meter water will exert a pressure equal to two atmosphere. And obviously there is atmosphere also present. So two atmosphere will be due to the water and one atmosphere is due to the atmosphere itself. So the pressure at the bottom due to water, two atmosphere and one actual atmosphere. So three atmosphere. So the pressure at the bottom of this lake is three atmosphere. So I am representing it with 3P. When the bubble is at the surface of the water, then there will be no pressure of the water. Only there will be atmosphere. So here the pressure is 1P only. Just one atmosphere. The pressure of the atmosphere only. Here at the surface of the lake, of the water, the volume of the bubble is 6 cm cube. The question is what is the volume of the bubble in the bed of the lake, at the bottom of the lake. 
so the temperature is not changing so we can apply the formula famous formula p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 when the temperature is kept constant the pressure of the gas i can apply this formula p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 p1 is 3 p v1 is question equals to p2 is single p and the v2 is 6 so v1 will be equals to p and p will be cancelled from both the sides if you know a little bit mathematics so v1 will be equals to 6 divided by 3 that will be 2 so the volume of the air bubble at the bottom of the lake is 2 cm cube it's a very famous and very important question i hope that you have understood this so 2 cm cube is the answer so a looks the option sir question number 16 a is the option question number 16 a is the option question number 17 a gas in a container of fixed volume is heated the volume is fixed the volume cannot change and it is heated the temperature is rising what happens to the molecules of the gas they collide less frequently no 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 they expand no the volume cannot change they move faster yes because you are increasing their temperature so they will move faster they move further apart no because the volume cannot change so they cannot move further apart so i think c is the best description they move faster because you are heating it so their temperature will rise which means their average kinetic energy will rise which means they will move faster so c is the option question number 17 you can see c is the right option here we go question number 18 which statement about the thermal radiation is correct which statement about the thermal radiation is correct in a vacuum thermal radiation travels at the speed of light that's true the thermal radiation is in the form of infrared rays infrared is a form of electromagnetic it's a part of electromagnetic spectrum and in vacuum it travels with the speed of light 3 x per 8 meter per second so a can be the answer thermal radiation is a longitudinal wave that's wrong thermal radiation is a transverse wave thermal radiation travels as an ultraviolet wave no thermal radiation travels in the form of infrared white surfaces are better emitter of thermal radiation than black surface that's wrong black is a better emitter so i think that a is the best option for question number 18 a looks the best option sir okay a is the best option for a transverse wave what is a wave front wave front is an imaginary is an imaginary line which join all the points in a wave which join all the adjacent points in a wave which are in the same phase wave front is an imaginary line is a, is a uh, is an imaginary line which joins all the adjacent points in a wave which are in same phase that's the definition of wave front so a line joining all the points on the same crest of a wave yes this is the definition a is the right definition of the wave front a let me check the other ones also a line showing the displacement of a wave that's wrong the energy content of a wave no the first part of a wave to reach a point no so a is the best option question number 19 a is the best option so the next one let me reduce the size a little bit okay so a longitudinal wave passes along a spring the coils of the spring vibrate from side to side the diagram shows the positions of the coils at one particular time which positions are one wavelength apart so one wavelength means uh, for example from the center of the 
of the compression to the center of the next compression or from the center of the rear fraction to the center of the next rear fraction. So I think it's the center of the compression. Y is the center of the compression. And Z is the center of the compression of the, ne the next compression. Yeah. So Y and Z, that represents one wavelength. Y, Z. Yeah. So D is the best answer, sir. Question number 20, D is the best op option. One wavelength means uh, the distance between uh, the one compression and the next compression. D. Let's check. D is the right answer, sir. Okay. Next question. Light is incident on a mirror. The light is reflected from the mirror. The angle of incidence is I and the angle of reflection is R. Which diagram correctly shows the I and R? You know the angle of incidence is the angle between the incident ray and the normal. Angle of reflection is the angle of is the angle between the reflected ray and the normal. And they both should be equals to each other. So the best option I think is C. All other options are wrong. You see the angle between the incident ray and the normal is I. The angle between the reflected ray and the normal is R. And they should be equal to each other. So C looks the best representation here. Question number 21, C is the option. Yes, C is the option, sir. Here we go. Which length is the focal length of the lens shown in the diagram? You see, the focal length is uh, the length between the optical center and the principal focus. It is the length between the optical center and the principal focus, this line which is coming parallel to the principal axis. And we know that after passing through the converging lens, it will pass through the principal focus. So here, where I have put my cursor, there you have the principal focus. So the distance between this principal focus and this is the optical center. This distance is known as the focal length. So I think B is the option, sir. B represents the focal length of this lens. Focal length is the distance between the principal focus, which we call F, and the optical center. Principal focus is here, where my cursor is. And the optical center is here in the center of the body of the lens. And the distance between them is represented by B here. So B is the focal length. Question number 22, B is the option, sir. Yeah, B is the option. Light passes from air into a glass block of refractive index 1.5 as shown. So here you can see the light is trying uh, has entered into a glass. The angle of incidence in the air is 57. The question is, what is the angle of refraction of the glass and what is the critical angle? They have asked you two questions. What is the angle of refraction and what is critical angle? Uh, the refractive index is given, the angle of incidence is given, so I know that n is equal to sine i divided by sine r. n is equal to sine i divided by sine r. Let, I've done this on a paper, let me show you. Okay. So um, n is equal to sine i divided by sine r, the value of the n, the refractive index is 1.5. I angle of incidence is 57, so sine 57 divided by sine R. So sine R will be equal to sine 57 divided by 1.5. Just do this in the calculation, in the calculator. So the answer will be 0 0.559. Make the R alone, sine will come to the other side. It will become sine inverse. So in your calculator, shift sine 0 0.559 equals to, and it will be 33.99 degree, which means 34 degrees. So it means that the angle of ref refraction will be 34 degree. Angle of refraction is 34 degree. Now, the second part of the question is, what is the critical angle? 
I know a formula, a famous formula. N is equals to 1 divided by sine C. Refractive index is equals to 1 divided by sine C. C is the critical angle. So sine C is equals to 1 divided by N. Sine C is equal to 1 divided by 1.5. And C will be equals to, when you do 1 divided by 1.5, it will be 0 0.67. So when the sine comes to this side, it will become sine inverse. So C will be equals to, on your calculator, write shift sine 0 0.67 equals to. It will give you an answer of 41.8, which is approximately 42. So it means the angle of refraction will be 34. And the critical angle will be 42 degrees. I hope you have understood this calculation. 34 and 42. Angle of, yeah, this is A is the best option, sir. Question number 23, A is the best option. Let's check. Yeah, A is the answer. Okay. Microwaves are used to transmit television signals to and from a satellite. Which statement about microwaves is correct? They have a longer wavelength than radio waves. They penetrate uh, the atmosphere without significant loss of energy. That is the reason why we use the microwaves. They have longer wavelength than radio waves. That's wrong. Radio waves have longer wavelength than the microwaves. C part is they travel faster than the radio waves in the vacuum. That's wrong. They all travel with the same speed. They warm the satellite and stop it freezing. No, that's wrong. Uh, we use microwaves because they can penetrate the atmosphere without significant loss of energy. So to me, B looks the best option, sir. 24B is the right option. Where are gamma rays used? In fluorescent tubes, in fluorescent tubes, we use UV light. In killing cancerous cells, yes, the gamma rays are used to kill the cancerous cells. In prenatal scanning, no, in prenatal scanning, we use ultrasound. And in sunbeds, in sunbeds, we use UV light. So B is the best option in killing cancerous cells. Question number 25, B is the right option. An intruder alarm, an intruder alarm is adjusted to give a quieter sound. He says quieter sound. When the sound will become quieter, its loudness will be less and the loudness depends upon the amplitude. If the sound has become quieter, it means its loudness has reduced. It means its amplitude is lower. Without affecting the pitch, Pitch depends upon the frequency, so the pitch is not affected, which means that the frequency is same, same. Frequency has not changed. How are the amplitude and the frequency of the sound affected? Because it becomes quieter, the so amplitude will be lower. The pitch has not changed, so the frequency will be the same. So I think B is the option. Question number 26. B is the option, sir. Four plotting compasses are placed near a bar magnet. You may ignore any effects of the Earth's magnetic field. One compass appears like this. So the pointer of the magnetic compass is pointing towards the bottom of this page. What is the possible position for the compass? You know, the needle of the compass or pointer of the compass always align itself with the magnetic lines. Whatever is the direction of the magnetic lines in that area, the magnetic uh, compass, its pointer will align itself 
with the magnetic lines present in that area. Let me show you my work. I have done this. So from there, it will be very easy for you to understand. You see, uh, the bar magnet here, do you have the north? So the magnetic lines are coming out of the north and they are going into the south from magnetic lines coming out of the north and they are going into the south pole. So if I put, put a magnetic compass here, the magnetic lines here are going downward towards the bottom of the page. So the magnetic compass will be pointing uh, towards the bottom of this page. So I think this is the location where the magnetic compass should be placed. And it will be like the diagram in the diagram he has shown. Let me show you again. So C is the option. If you put this magnetic compass here, because here the magnetic lines will be going like this. So at the C, the needle of the magnetic compass or the pointer of the magnetic compass will be like this at position C. A little bit tricky, but I hope you have understood. So C is the answer. Question 27. Yes, sir. C is the option. The diagram shows an uncharged ball coated with metallic paint. The ball is suspended from an insulating thread. It is placed near a positively charged rod. So you see this has a metallic uh, paint over it. Here I have a charge, positive charge. So this end of the ball, the electrons will be attracted and this end will become negative. This, the left end will become positive. So which diagram shows the charge distribution on the ball? I think D is the best option. I hope you have understood. D represents the best distribution of the charge. Question number 28, D is the option, sir. And yes, we are right. Okay. So here we go. Question number 29. A current in a car headlamp is 2 ampere. The headlamp is switched on for 4 minutes. How much charge passes through the headlamp? You know, uh, I is equals to Q by T. So Q will be equals to I multiply T. But the one thing, the precaution you have to take is that the time should be in seconds. Here, the time given is in minutes. It's a very, very important precaution. The time given is in minutes. You need to convert this into seconds. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So I is equals to Q by T. So Q will be equals to I multiply T. I is 2 ampere. Multiply time. Time is 4 minutes. But we don't take the time in minutes in this formula. We take the time in seconds. So 2 multiply 4 multiply 60. Why I multiply with 60 to convert the minutes into seconds. So the final answer will be 480 coulomb. 480 coulomb. Question number 29. 480 coulomb. Let's check the options. Oh, D is the option, sir. Question number 29, D is the right option. Uh, how, question number 30. How can one volt also be expressed? You know the volt, it is uh, work done divided by charge. The formula for the voltage is energy divided by charge, work done divided by charge. So work done is Newton. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Work done is joules and the charge is coulomb. So it's one joule per coulomb. Work done divided by charge. So the unit will be one joule per coulomb. Question number 30, D is the option. That's right. Question number 30, D is the option, sir.
the cell lamps and resistors in the circuits are identical in which circuit is the lamp the brightest the lamp will be brightest wherever the lamp is getting the most of the voltage and the highest amount of current you see here the the cell is same same in all the four figures and here you have a resistor before the lamp they connected in series so they will have high resistance overall so the current coming from the battery will be low some voltage will be taken by this resistor and some voltage will come in the for the lamp here you have connected two resistors in series with the lamp so here the amount of current will be less and the voltage which the lamp will get because the, this resistor and this resistor they both are taking the voltage so some voltage will be coming in the, the sh some share of the voltage will be for this lamp also here in the c option you can see the two resistors they are connected parallel to each other and you know when we connect the resistors in parallel to each other their resistance their combined resistance their overall resistance even become smaller than the smaller of them the when you connect the resistors in parallel that combined resistance becomes smaller even smaller than the individual resistance so here they too will have very low resistance so the resistance of this whole circuit will be low so the amount of current coming from the battery will be high because they are connected in parallel to each other so they will take very a small amount of voltage as compared to the other options so the lamp will have higher voltage comparative to the other options so here the lamp in the c option the lamp will be getting the more voltage and more obviously more current coming from the battery so this lamp will be brightest so i think c is the option here you can see here again a resistor is connected in series directly so and there is here we have the parallel combination but due to this resistor the resistance of the whole circuit will be high and the current coming from the battery will be low and obviously this will take some voltage this uh, combination will take some voltage and this lamp will have relatively less voltage as compared to the c option so in the c option the lamp will have large amount of current flowing through it and the amount of voltage or voltage drop will be higher so the power will be higher around this lamp and this lamp will be the brightest i think c is the option i i think it's a little tricky because this whole thing was conceptual nothing to be calculated only conceptual thing that why this lamp will be brightest because it is get it is getting the most of the voltage highest voltage and it is getting the highest amount of current possible in these four options so the lamp c will be the lamp in the c option will be the brightest question number 31c let me check the c 31c is the option that's our answer is right this question i think is a little tricky for you but uh, I've tried to explain. Here we go. Question number 32 is on your screen. The graph is the voltage current graph for two resistors wire P and Q. Okay. So on the Y axis, the voltage is represented. On the X axis, you know, uh, I hope you can see this. Uh, on the y axis the voltage is represented on the x axis the current is represented and if i will take the slope of this graph that will be voltage divided by current and that will be equals to the resistance the voltage the gradient of this graph the slope of these graphs that is that represents v by i and that represents the resistance so the p has greater gradient so it means its resistance will be higher and the Q's resistance as compared to the P, the gradient of the Q is less. So its resistance will also less. P has higher gradient. It means it has larger gradient. It means its resistance will be also larger because the, the graph, its gradient is equal to the resistance. The wires are made from the same material and have equal length. Let me show you. Reduce the size. 
Let me further reduce the size so you can see the whole question. The wires are made from the same material and have equal lengths. The resistance of the wires and their cross-sectional areas are different. Which, which wire has the greater resistance and which wire has the larger cross-sectional area? You know, the greater resistance is definitely P. The greater resistance is definitely P because its gradient is more on the VT, V current and voltage graph. And if the cross-sectional area will be larger, try to understand this uh, uh, explanation. Greater resistance is P. Okay, that's good. But if a conductor has a larger cross-sectional area, its resistance will be low. Because both the conductors, they are made of the same material, they have the same length. So if the conductor has a larger area, cross-sectional area, I mean, then its resistance will be low. So Q has lower resistance as compared to P. So it means its cross-sectional area is larger. So the greater resistance is P and the greatest uh, larger cross-sectional area is Q. To me, B looks the best option. Question number 32, B looks the best option. Let us check. Let us check. Question number 32, oh, B is the option, sir. Oops. Okay, again. A lamp is connected to a to the AC main supply in series with a switch and a fuse. Which circuit shows these components wired correctly? You see, the fuse and the switch. The fuse and the switch. They should be connected in the live wire. The fuse and the switch, they should be connected in the live wire. So the best option is C. The fuse and the switch, they must be in the live wire. That's the rule of uh, for this wiring. So C is the option. Question 33, C is the option, sir. Yeah, question 33, C is the option. A student is investigating resistance using the circuit shown. The resistance of R is approximately 5 ohm. <coughs> what are the most suitable ranges of for the voltmeter and for the ammeter? You see, this is a very, uh, you can say, it was a tricky question. So I've done this on a paper. Let me show you how I have tried to solve this. So I know that the resistance is 5 ohm. And I know the ranges of the voltmeter. So I will take the maximum voltage. And uh, let's try what is the amount of... I will calculate how much is the current. Then we will see that if the ammeter is suitable or not. In the first option... The maximum voltage can be provided is 2 ampere, uh, 2 volt. So take that value. So 2 divided by 5, resistance is 5. 0 0.4 ampere. So the reading of the current will be 0 0.4 ampere. Then I will check. For this current, the ammeter which he has given, is this the suitable uh, ammeter? For measuring 0 0.4 ampere, I think 0, 0.0 to 0 0.5 ampere will be the best ammeter. It will show a large deflection. Okay, let's try the other ones also. In this B part, V is 2, resistance is 5, we know. The, the, the current comes out to be 0 0.4 ampere in the second B option. Let me check. Let me go back. I'll show you that the, the ammeter is not suitable. 
the ammeter is from 0 to 2 ampere. So this ammeter will be not that suitable. The current is 0 0.4 ampere. For this purpose, if I use uh, ammeter which is from 0 to 4, 2 ampere, the reading shown will be not that large as that was in the A option. Okay, so let me do C. You can see C in the C part. The let me do the voltage, the maximum voltage was 5, 5 divided by 5, 1 ampere, and in the D part, 10 by 2, 5, 2 ampere. So in the C, 1 ampere and 2 ampere, let's check whether the ammeters are suitable or not. 1 ampere and 2 ampere, you see. Here I get 1 ampere. So this 0 to 5, that can measure that 1 ampere, but it will be not that sensitive. It will not show large deflection like it showed in the A part. And D, here you the current will be 2 ampere for from 0 to 5 ampere. The option shown will be not that large. So A looks the best option to me. Question number 34, I don't know, but let's check the answer. Maybe 34A is the option. I hope you have understood that the idea by which I am trying to solve it. Uh, that which ammeter is the best. It was very tricky question. No. Question number 35. Uh, a split ring commutator that's used in a, in, a, in, a, in a motor. A split ring commutator is used in a simple DC motor. It reverses the current in the coil. How often does it reverse the current? How often does it re reverse the current? In a complete cycle, when the coil of the motor takes a complete circle, complete rotation, in one complete rotation, it reverses the direction of the current two times. So every two turns, no. Every full turn, no. Every half turn, yes. After in, in complete rotation, it do it two times. It reverses the direction of the current two times. So every half turn. Yes, that wording is right. Every half turn. 35B looks the best option, sir. Yeah. I hope you have understood. Actually, you see what happens in a complete rotation. It reverses the direction of the current two times. So after one half rotation, direction of the current is changed. So every half turn. Next question. It says... Hmm. It's not showing full, so reduce the size. Which component when used in a circuit allows current to pass in only one direction? Diode. This is the purpose of the diode. Diode will only allow the current to flow in the one direction. If the current will come from the other direction or the opposite direction, it will not let the current pass through it. So resistance will become very high. The symbol for the diode is this. A option. A is the option. So let me check the answer. Yeah, A is the option. Question number 36. A is the option. Okay, here we go. A potential divider consists of a thermistor and a light dependent resistor LDR. So here we have a LDR and here we have a thermistor and from the LDR he has taken V out. So you know the thermistor, its resistance depends upon the temperature. If the temperature will be high, the thermistor resistance will be low. If the, the temperature will be low, the resistance will be high. So in the cold, resistance is higher. And in the hot, 
the resistance is lower. I'm talking about thermistor resistance. In the LDR case, if there is bright light, the resistance will be low. If it's dark, the resistance will be high. So his question is, which conditions give the smallest voltage V across the LDR? If you want this V out to be smallest, here the resistance will be should be low. If you want the V out to be zero, the resistance of the LDR should be lowest. And when the resistance of the LDR is lowest, when it is bright, and the resistance of the thermistor should be high. Thermistor of the, the resistance of the thermistor is high when it is cold. So it should be cold and light. Cold and light. Oh my God. B is the right option. Actually, I was trying to. So B is the right option. Question number 37. You can see B is the right option. Which type, which type of radiation consists of electrons? You know the beta particles, they are electrons. Beta particles. It's a fact. So it's very easy. Alpha particles, they are like the nucleus of helium. Beta particles, they are like electrons. Gamma rays, they are electromagnetic. X rays, they are electromagnetic. So beta particles. Oh my God. It again highlighted all of them. So question number 38, B is the option. Beta particles are like electrons. This question, question number 39, a little bit tricky question. I will tell you what's the trick in it. A sample of radioactive isotope produces a count rate of 10,000 counts per minute. The half-life of the isotope is one day. So half-life of the isotope is one day. After one day, this big thing becomes, the count rate becomes half. What was the count rate of the sample two days ago? The question is different. It's not the routine question. He's saying, what was the count rate of the sample two days ago? Normally, the question is, uh, what is the count rate of the sample after two days? But he has asked a very tricky question. He says, Two days ago. Let me show you my paperwork. I have done this on a paper. So I can show you my work. Okay. Try to understand the trick in this question. So here we started observation. 10,000 is the count rate. If one day will pass, because the half-life is one day, it will become 5,000. Another one day will pass. It will become 2,500. But before this point one day ago it will be double of this to 20,000 and another day ago it will be 40,000 his question was very tricky normally they ask you what will be the count rate after two days but here in this question he asked you a very tricky question he asked you what was the count rate two days ago that was if you understand this grid that was 40,000 so from here, if you're going upward, it, sh it should double. Okay. I hope you have understood. So the reading is 40,000. So to me, D looks the option. D is the option, sir. Let's check. <clears throat> okay so on your screen we have the next question question number 40 which statement about a nucleus of uh, nitrogen 715 is correct okay so let me go to the paperwork so i can show you how we have done this okay i have not even yet read the question but uh, you know, this means there are seven protons and there are seven, uh, sorry, 15 minus seven, it will be eight neutrons. So there are seven protons and eight neutrons in the nucleus. Let me check options. 
The nucleus contains seven neutrons and eight protons. No, that's wrong. The nucleus contains seven neutrons and 15 protons. That's wrong. The nucleus contains seven protons and eight neutrons. This, this is the best option, sir. The nucleus contains seven proton and 15 neutron. That's wrong. So very easy question. C is the right option. Let me check. Question number 40. Yeah, C is the right option, sir. So, so we have reached the end of this uh, paper. Today, uh, we have done, uh, we were studying physics 5054. And we were doing an MCQ paper. And today we have done uh, May, June 2016, 1 1 paper. And I have tried my level best to explain the concepts that how I came to the correct options, how I choose the correct option. I hope that these videos, they are very helpful to you. So, uh, so you thank you very much, everybody. And, you know, if these videos, um, if you're looking at this video, and this video is helpful to you in studying and preparing your physics, kindly subscribe my YouTube channel. And also kindly uh, press the like button. Also press the bell icon because it will support me. If you subscribe my channel, it will support me. I will continue preparing the solving the physics paper and posting them in YouTube. And they will be very helpful for a lot of students. So by watching these videos, you are able to prepare your physics uh, for your upcoming exams without going anywhere, without taking any tuition. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day and God bless you all.